Hello, welcome everyone. I'd like to take the next few minutes to review an important case in which hyperacute T waves were overlooked while a patient was having an acute MI. This is a 39 year old male, former smoker, who presented to the emergency department with two hours of crushing chest pain. And here's the initial EKG. What do we see? So we see tall T waves, very symmetric. They're not as pointed or tented as the ones you'd see with hyperkalemia, but you're going to want to rule that out also. So these are hyperacute T waves, and they're seen here in the anterior leads, especially V2 through V4, maybe even V1. No ST segment elevation, and the patient actually tells the ED doctor that he's had pain like this in the past, that it resolves on its own. Initial troponin is normal. Sublingual nitroglycerin is ineffective. So what do you do in this situation? So this is a pretty tough case. So let's take a moment to review the timing of EKG changes that you might see with an acute MI. So hyperacute T waves, they can often occur within minutes. ST changes occur within minutes to hours. And Q waves occur within hours to days after an acute MI. So I'd have to argue that we're trained to focus on the ST segment elevation. And oftentimes we don't even think about hyperacute T waves when we're looking at an EKG. So back to this initial EKG, we definitely have hyperacute T waves. The patient was not taken to the cath lab at that time. So here we are at four hours. So an EKG was done again at four hours. Now what do we have? So well, you're going to first appreciate that the T waves are no longer tall, right? But now we have an even more concerning finding, and that is Q waves. So we've gone from hyperacute T waves to Q waves over a four hour period. Now there were no EKGs done in the interim, so it's possible that the ST segment elevation had occurred sometime in between. So this is a huge problem. So we're clearly outside of the 90 minute door to balloon time for PCI. Despite this, the patient was rushed to the cath lab. And we're gonna look at some images from uh, the right anterior oblique caudal view. So this is just a diagram to help orient us. So contrast is going to be injected into the left coronary artery. So that's the area that should enhance. It's going to be the left main. We should see the left anterior descending, and we should also see the left circumflex. And here is the coronary angiogram. So again, right anterior oblique caudal view. And this is showing us that we have a huge problem. So the patient had a complete proximal LAD occlusion and we can probably see this better by looking at the still views. So there's the left circumflex, which actually gives off a rather large OM1. Now the LAD should be here, but we're getting Timmy zero flow. So we're getting no flow to the LAD. So the patient undergoes subsequent aspiration thrombectomy. And now the LAD comes into view. Timmy three flow is restored. Plavix and Reapro are given. Promis 4x15 stent was placed in the proximal LAD. So the patient sent back to the floor. Post PCI EKG is shown here. So the Q waves persist as we'd expect. Troponin is now 11. So what's the diagnosis? So this is a Q wave MI, right? We never saw ST segment elevation. So I don't think we can call it that. So I think we have to call this case the Q-wave MI. Transthoracic echo was done afterwards, revealed an EF of 45 to 50%, akinesis of the entire apex, mid-anterior, mid anteroseptal segments, which corresponds to a mid to distal LA territory uh, lesion. Going back in retrospect, why were these hyperacute T-waves overlooked? So realize that the troponin was initially negative, Sublingual nitroglycerin did not relieve the chest pain. The patient was only 39, didn't really have any risk factors except for a previous smoker. And he kept telling the ED doctor that he's had similar pain like this in the past. And there were only two EKGs. So I'd have to argue that we're trained to focus on the ST segment elevation. So in conclusion, the hyperacute T wave should have prompted activation of the cath lab as these are the earliest findings that are seen in an acute MI. 
And if there's any uncertainty, an EKG should be repeated immediately, and it should also be followed every 15 minutes. And I believe that goes along with the guidelines. So that's it. So hopefully this was helpful. Until next time, so long.